is this guy? Yes, this guy. This this isn't mine. I don't know. Sorry about that. This guy. Who is this? Well, picture a massive buff red dude with a cube-shaped head and a pyramid hat. And those eyes? He's got four round yellow ones with green pupils. Don't forget his gnarly purple forked tongue and those orange yellow talons on his fingers and toes. Pretty crazy, right? So the first time that- But actually before that, please subscribe. It really helps. All right, let's get back to it. So the first time that we actually get a glimpse of this guy is in the episode of Pahoy. Look up how to say that. It's actually in the episode. Didn't even know that, but yeah, Pahoy. Pahoy! And Finn just bumps into him after croaking from the pillow work. No biggie, right? But trust me, this name drop is just the start of Golb's epic role later on in the series. All right, so this dude's got some pretty gnarly powers up his sleeve. Like he can zip through dimensions and whip up portals like it's no big deal. And turning living beings into monsters or mashing them up with other creatures? Yup, he's got that covered too, just by huffing and puffing on. Now, if you think that's crazy, he can also make people or stuff vanish from existence just by gobbling them up. And if you thought you could hurt this guy with some powerful attacks or magic well think again he can take them all without even breaking a sweat except for music which we will touch on later so stick around gold is this nearly unbreakable being that can break folks down to their basic forms basically wiping them out of existence that little shout out to gold and poi is like an early how do you do to this wickedly cool character who ends up being super important in the adventure time world that's just the beginning of gold's story in adventure time there is so much more lore and mystique to this character like what's his purpose in the adventure time universe I hear you loud and clear. Trust me. Wait till the end and all of your questions will be answered. However, to really better understand Golb, let's take it back, way back, to when the Adventure Time universe was just a crazy mishmash of monsters like Orgolorg and Kokon Tepi. These gnarly guys finally agreed on what reality should look like. And boom, the multiverse was born. Now, according to the Enchiridion, the multiverse isn't really about the physical stuff. It's actually more about how everybody's consciousness shapes it. That means all the thinking, feeling beings in the multiverse kind to keep it alive just by living their lives but as far as the real nitty gritty of the multiverse's beginnings and what it's really all about well that's still a big old mystery pretty much all we've got to go on is what the lich saw way back when he took a peek into the past so these ancient monsters cooked up a wild multiverse, right? It's got a crazy huge, maybe even infinite number of dimensions, each with its own universe. We're talking about places like the Earth Dimension, where we see U, the Astral Plane, the Crystal Dimension, Lumpy Space, the Nidosphere, the Citadel, and a whole bunch more. Now, smack dab in the middle of this multiverse party is the Time Room, a dimension that's chilling outside of time and where our all-powerful buddy Prismo lives. It's the hub. It's like the main point of the entire universe, I think. And that's how the universe works, right? Where Golb resides. Now let's start to take a closer look at what Golb is and how we see him portrayed in the Adventure Time series. Now Golb's seen as a pretty much all-powerful chaos and destruction machine by the characters. This idea has pumped up even more since Golb's been around since before the multiverse got its act together, or at least what we know of. The characters' grasp on Golb's power and impact really shows how immense the cosmic entity lineup is for the series. For the folks living it up in the land of U, Golb's like a danger they just can't beat, making them face their own limits when they're up against this colossal force. And Gulp ain't just showing up in the series by making face-to-face -face appearances. This big bad's also talked about and hinted at by all sorts of characters. In the episode You Forgot Your Floaties, Gulp gets a name dropped when we learn about Magic Man's super sad past. Magic Man's better half, Margols, got snatched by Gulp, and now he's got a heart full of hurt and a mission to get her back. Gulp gets another shout out in Whispers, where the Lich, a really old school baddie, throws in a quick mention of our chaos causing friend. The Lich talking about Golb just goes to show how seriously powerful Golb is. The fact that one of the series' toughest bad guys is giving Golb props really tells you a thing or two about where Golb stands. Or at least what we think. More on that later. Pretty much all those times Golb pops up and gets name dropped in Adventure Time really just help to hype up the big face off that goes down in the series finale Come Along With Me. They help paint Golb as a real mysterious and crazy powerful character. Although we don't know his motives yet. As our heroes try to wrap their heads around Golb and all the chaos it's got going on. Their epic quest to save the land of U from this ancient baddie turns into a major part of the series storyline. Probably the most major part of the series as a whole. Now let's get into this 
crazy series finale come along with me. Gulb crashes the party as the major troublemaker for the land of Ooh. In this episode, we see different groups from Ooh, like Princess Bubblegum's crew and Gumball's gang, putting their beefs on hold to deal with this cosmic powerhouse. Gulb's off the chart destructive skills and love for chaos really test our heroes, making them dig deep and rely on their smarts, quick thinking, and some solid teamwork to tackle a challenge that seems almost too big to handle. So how does Gulb get quote unquote defeated? Well, you remember when I said music was gonna play a big part down the line? Well, here it is. Right in the thick of it, BMO, the adorable walking, talking video game console plays a super in part in chipping away at Gulb's defenses. By belting out a touching tune, BMO manages to tap into the magical vibes of their pals and partners, whipping up a harmony that jives with Gulb and messes with its chaos-loving mojo. Although, technically it doesn't really phase him, it still makes a hole in him. Just enough for Finn and Simon to escape, so you gotta wonder, what if it was just really loud? Would Gulb just cease to disappear? Whatever, I'm getting ahead of myself. But like I said, Finn and Simon escape, Betty sacrifices herself inside of Gulb with the wishing crown. But Betty doesn't manage to turn Simon back into his old self. However, her actions do wind up being the key to Gulb's downfall. She ends up merging with the cosmic bigwig and persuades it to hightail it out of the land of Ooh, saving both Simon and the whole wide world in the process. All right, it's the time you all have been waiting for. It's theory time. Now, you gotta hear me out, because this is pretty wild, maybe not. What if Gulb is actually Prismo's boss that we keep hearing about, or at the very very least, he's like the top dog in the Adventure Time universe. He was there before the monsters were even created. But get this, I don't think he's all bad. I think that Gold might not be some evil dude after all. Instead, he's got this higher purpose, kind of like the Citadel's gig and keeping the multiverse all orderly and stuff. Picture Gold as a cosmic cop, erasing those who go around committing universal scale crimes from existence. That way, he's making sure everything stays balanced. Okay, we got some evidence to back this up. Let's start with the first one. And it's all about the episode. Pahoy. In that one, Finn sort of bites the dust in the pillar world and makes his way back to the land of Ooh. Now, maybe Finn ticked off the universe by being in two places at once, because although Finn says that it was a dream, we never actually see him fall asleep. He just crawls into the pillow fort and all of a sudden, he's in the pillow world. Then that's where Gold comes in, ready to wipe him from existence. But get this, it seems like Gold doesn't exactly nail it. He's left scratching his head when Finn bounces off his tongue and zips back to his own world. Honestly, when he turns around to see Finn leaving, he looks pretty confused, but that little twist hints that maybe Gulb's real job is fixing imbalances like this, not just running around causing chaos for the heck of it. Now when he does show up, sure, he does bring chaos and disorder, but I don't think it's random. Now, I already know what you're saying. What about Margles? Didn't he just attack Mars and take her? Well, we're actually still in the dark about why Margles goes poof, but maybe she pulled off some cosmic shenanigans that made Gulb step in. We do know that they went to Mount Olympus after being told not to, and maybe Mount Olympus was this weird cosmic summoning ground where they're not supposed to go. And when she pulled off these cosmic shenanigans, that made Gulb step in. I mean, even Prismo, this mega powerful cosmic dude can't wish her back. This kind of hints that maybe Gulb's actions were super important for keeping everything all balanced and harmonious in the cosmos. All right, now get ready. This is the juiciest piece of evidence that pops up in the series finale come along with in this one, we know that Betty, with a little help from Majin and Kingman, summoned Gulb to Ooh. Now, we don't actually see the process. We see kind of the process. She straps in to Maja and does this weird hand movement, but we actually don't know what's going on. We do know that Betty needed a crazy amount of power and energy, like maybe enough to pull off some universal scale crime that needs Gulb to jump in and fix things. And that's why Gulb shows up, maybe, who knows? But I believe that Gulb showing up in Ooh isn't just random, it's all cause of what Betty's been up to. But here's the kicker, we know that Gulb technically doesn't get taken down in the finale. Instead, he kind of fuses with Betty and then hits the road. But this twist actually backs up my theory, since all Betty really wants is to keep Simon safe, no matter the cost. And by merging with Gulb and getting wiped from existence, Betty's making up for her cosmic oopsie. And Gulb's exit? Well that just lines up with this whole mission of fixing the universe's wonky imbalances. Betty committed a crazy cosmic cosmic crime with the power and energy of Maja, causing Gulb to enter Ooh, and when Gulb leaves Ooh, he takes Betty with him to make up for a cosmic crime. I just thought that that made a little sense, but who knows. We've just waded through the mind-boggling enigma that is Gulb. And guess what's next on our mystery tour? Uncovering the secret behind Ooh's transformation in Adventure Time. Oh hey look it, it's Minerva and all the other humans bribing to Ooh. Surely nothing bad will happen, right? Oh my god, what happened? What in the world could have brought about such a wild transformation? 
transformation. Well, today, we're going to dive headfirst into the nitty gritty unraveling the enigma behind Ooze's desolation and the destiny of our main man Finn and his human buddies. Let's get started. Post the epic Great Gum War and Gol believing Ooze and the great entrance of our human palace from the Hub Island, the land of Ooze was basking in some good old peace and prosperity vibes. Finn, our main dude who bridged the gap between humans and the colorful Ooze residents, played a pretty big role in making the future all bright and shiny. But plot twist. Fast forward a thousand years, and we're looking into a future that's dark, gloomy, and it looks like totally human free. What the heck went down to turn things into this barren wasteland? Well, before we get into that, let's take a wild guess at what might have gone down once those Hub Island humans made their grand entrance to Ooo. In the aftermath, our main dude Finn Human and his new human buddies, with a little help from a nervous consciousness, might have kicked off this super ambitious project to rebuild and restore the land of Ooo. And with humans back in the mix, Ooo got a sweet shot in the arm with a whole lot of human culture, tech, and know-how. Finn, being the ultimate bridge between the humans and the wild and wacky Ooo inhabitants, probably played a super important part in getting everybody to play nice and work together. But hey, this is adventure time we're talking about. Stuff's always changing, right? And boy, did it ever change. Like humans going in the way of the dodo and the land of Ooo turning into a barren, desolate wasteland kind of change. Now I've got a couple of wild ideas brewing in my noggin that might just explain how we got from A to Z. Let's start with idea number one. The humans and Rainicorns might have had a falling out big time. I mean, think about it. In the episode Her Parents, we see that Lady Rainicorn's parents love the taste of human and were just about to go crazy on Finn until Jake stopped. Although they say they've never tasted human, they love the taste of soy human because they thought the humans were extinct. So the humans finally coming back to Ooo might have channeled that inner crave of the Rainicorns to want to eat humans, leading to a crazy crazy long war that left everybody licking their wounds and Ooo looking like a total mess. And even though our boy Finn was doing his darnest to keep everyone to play nice, sometimes those ancient feuds and cross wires are just too gnarly to untangle. And that's how we ended up with the barren Ooo we see way off in the future. Now on to theory number two. It's all about that catalyst comet, baby. I mean, these bad things pack a serious punch when it comes to shaking things up. And throughout the entire series, we've seen catalyst comets play a huge part in Ooo's history. Like when we see the Lich is the Green Catalyst Comet, and it's revealed that Finn is the reincarnation of a past comet in the Comet episode. So maybe a new Catalyst Comet swung by and threw Ooo into a whirlwind of change and chaos, making it a total no-go zone for our human pals. You know, these wild ideas start to make a whole lot more sense when you think about how Adventure Time is all about change and things not sticking around forever. Ooo's had its fair share of ups and downs, like the Mushroom War that turned the world into the land of Ooo we all know and love, and the Lich getting all evil mastermindy and trying to wipe out life as we know it. So seeing Ooo all desolate and empty way off in the future, it's just another spin on the old cycle of breaking down and building back up with new life and funky fresh civilizations just waiting for their chance to rise from the dust. We've just cracked the code on Ooo's magical metamorphosis, but wait, there's more. Are you ready to switch gears from fabulous transformations to brace yourself, the tragic story of Lemon Hope? The story of Lemon Hope is tragic. I mean, at times he can be a selfless jerk, but at the same time, I can't help but feel bad for the guy. I mean, at the end of the day, he didn't ask to be saved, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's dive into this wild ride, where we'll see him transform from a dude who's just unsure of himself to kind of a wise guy who knows what freedom is really all about. Alrighty, first up, let's chat about Lemon Hope's roots before he gets busted out of Castle Lemon Grab. He's your typical lemon citizen, tortured by his tyrant Lemon Grab. He just loves playing the harp, but something's different. He's actually good at what he plays, unlike all the other citizens. So, with the help of Princess Bubblegum and the Lemon Citizens, they break Lemon Hope out of Castle Lemongrass. Now Lemon Hope's chilling in the Candy Kingdom, a place full of sugary goodness. But our lemony friend ain't all smiles, cause he's got this massive weight on his shoulders from the Lemon Peeps and Princess Bubblegum. Our bro's gotta learn the hero stuff, but he's itching to explore the great wide world. He's all tangled up inside, wanting to break free, but also feeling like he's gotta do right by his people. So PB takes Lemon Hope to see the mess at Castle Lemongrab, and our guy makes a big old decision. He sneaks out and boards a pirate ship, thinking he's finally Finally gonna find its freedom, but there's a whole bunch of bumps in the road ahead, my friends. In the meantime, though, Lemon Hope's loving his pirate adventure, feeling the wind in his hair and the salty 
sea breeze, but fate's got other plans, and our boy ends up stranded in the desert, with nothing but his past and his guilt keeping him company. As he treks through the sandy wasteland, he's all sorts of tested. Just when he's about to give up, he meets Flannel Boxing Day, a wise old dude who's got adventures in his bones. They set off together on monster hunting escapades and treasure finding missions, but Lemon Hope can't shake his nightmares, and Flannel's wise words gets him thinking. He realizes that the only way he'll be truly free is by fulfilling his destiny and saving his people. So, our lemony hero decides it's time to face his fate and Emperor Lemon Grab. He goes back to the castle and with the power of his harp, makes that tyrant go kaboom, free and his bros and earn his own freedom. With his peeps saved, Lemon Hope can finally live his life without a heavy heart. He explores the world, taking on every adventure he can. Eventually, he returns to the now empty Cannon Kingdom in Castle Lemon Grab, ready to rest after a lifetime of freedom. Lemon Hope's tale is a wicked ride through the struggle between what we want and the responsibilities we've got. Across this two-parter, we see Lemon Hope hustling to find his own way, buttoned heads with the expectations others put on him. A big old theme in his story is freedom, and how it's all tangled up with responsibility. Lemon Hope, after dealing with some major bad advice from the Lemon Grabs, is stuck with everyone thinking he's gonna save his people, while he's all about being free from that nastiness. The pressure to live up to his destiny is a heavy load. The showdown plays out in his dreams, which are like trippy windows into his inner chaos. In his dreams, Lemon Hope faces off with the not-so-black-and-white choices he's gotta make, and the guilt of bailing on his people. These scenes are like super eye-catching and deep, going into the nitty-gritty of Lemon Hope's character. The gray stuff around him shows the moral mess he's in, while the knocking at his door is like the non-stop push to do his duty. Throughout the story, Lemon Hope's selfish side isn't painted as a bad thing, but more like a normal reaction to the huge burden on him. His hangouts with Flannel Boxing Day, a mysterious dude who might be tight with Princess Bubblegum, you never know, help Lemon Hope grow and get a grip on freedom. Flannel being there, whether he's real or just in Lemon Hope's head, it's Lemon Lemon Hope to see that freedom doesn't mean flying solo. This light bulb moment is huge because it makes Lemon Hope decide to head back to Castle Lemon Grab and save his peeps. But don't forget, he does it his way, showing he's all about being free. Lemon Hope's story really hits home that there's no one size fits all hero. While Finn the Human's your classic hero, Lemon Hope's journey shows there are tons of ways to be a hero. By saving his people, even if it's just because he wants to, Lemon Hope finds that sweet spot between freedom and duty. In the end, Lemon Hope's actions leave a mark on the land of Oot. Like the glimpses of the future during Princess Bubblegum's tune. Even though he didn't want to be a hero, Lemon Hope's legacy is just that. It's a reminder that sometimes expectations can be too much, and it's key to know and accept our own limits. That was a sour yet sweet dive into the tragic story of Lemon Hope, wasn't it? But hold on to your hats, because now we're about to zoom straight into something equally gripping, the truth behind Finn's arm in Adventure Time. Okay, so Ice King and Betty both change. I'm so excited to see what Finn changes into. Maybe he'll regrow his arm. Maybe he'll turn into Shoko, maybe even the Catalyst comment. Wait, what? Why didn't he change? Have you ever wondered why Finn's arm remained missing despite the magic that restored Simon and Betty? Well, today we're diving deep into this mystery. And what if I told you that the answer lies not only in Finn's past lives, but also in his personal growth? We'll explore how Finn's acceptance of his loss might have played a role in this outcome. But before that, please smash the subscribe button like Marceline, Finn, and Jake. Thank you all so much. Let's get into it. First off, Finn's original primal form is the one without an arm, not the one where he's got both arms intact. But how can we be so sure about this? Well, we've actually seen it a bunch of times. In Pahoy, Finn's got this crazy pill-like robotic arm in Pillow World. In Finn Human, Farm World, Finn's rocking a prosthetic arm with a blade. In Mortal Folly, Finn sees a vision of his future self. And guess what? He's got a robotic arm. And hey, let's not forget one of Finn's past lives, Shoko, who's also missing an arm. With all these examples, it's kind of hard not to think that maybe it's Finn's destiny or fate to lose his arm at some point in his life, and that Gobel's magic just couldn't change that. Okay, so let's dig even deeper into Finn's destiny by checking out this whole theme of loss that keeps popping up throughout the series. Are there other moments when Finn's dealt with loss? And how does it all tie in with the big picture? In Adventure Time, Finn goes through all sorts of loss, from breakups and friendships to his own sense of who he is. These losses usually push him to grow and develop as a character. For example, when Finn loses his relationship with Flame Princess, he's gotta face his feelings and learn how to deal with rejection. All these tough experiences really help Finn become more resilient and able to roll with the punches, including, you know, losing his arm. But let's shift gears a little bit and chat about Finn's emotional journey. What if his personal growth had a say in how things turned out? How might his inner transformation have changed the game? What really matters here is that Finn didn't want or need to go back to his form with both arms intact. If 
feels like normal, I guess. It feels right or something. I mean, unlike Simon and Betty, who were dealing with all that magic messing with their minds and bodies, Finn had come to terms with losing his arm and moved on. He figured out how to deal with this depression and found happiness in other ways. This personal growth kind of makes me think that Gold's magic couldn't turn back to his primal form because he just didn't want it or need it. So to really get Finn's emotional journey, let's take a closer look at how acceptance plays its part in his story. How does coming to terms with loss shape Finn's overall character growth? By being cool with his missing arm, Finn shows he's got a pretty mature understanding of his situation and proves he can bounce back from tough times. This acceptance is actually super important for his character development because it helps him become more understanding and caring towards others. Dealing with loss and tough stuff, like Finn being okay with his missing arm, helps him to connect to others. Like when Fern fades away, Finn is able to comfort him in his last breaths. And how Finn learned to accept and move on from his deadbeat dad, who was just always on the run and didn't want to be there for his son. So we've talked about Finn's different forms, his emotional journey, and how acceptance plays a part in his story. Could the mix of destiny and personal growth be the secret sauce to figuring out why Finn's arm never came back? When we think about both Finn's destiny across all those timelines and his emotional journey, it kind of seems like there's a two-part answer to why his arm didn't return. First, it was just meant to be that he lose it. And second, he'd grown to accept and be cool with that loss. This acceptance meant that Gold's magic didn't need to fix his arm because Finn had already found happiness and purpose without it. Now that we've flexed our detective muscles on that mystery, are you ready for something even more amazing? That's right. It's time to bounce from Finn's fascinating limb lore to, drum roll please, discovering the magical secrets of Jake's future pup descendants in Adventure Time. Have you ever wondered how many other pups there are in the future of Adventure Time? Well, hold on tight because today we're uncovering the hidden world of pups and their incredible powers. Now, you might already know Jake and Lady Rainicorn's children, Charlie, Viola, TV, Kim, Kawan, and Jake Jr. And maybe you've heard of Brown and Gibbon, but what if I told you there are even more pups with amazing abilities waiting to be discovered? And the cherry on top, we might even finally understand how Wu operates 1,000 years in the future. So let's get right into it. Let's start off with the pups that we already know. All right, so Charlie's got this mind-blowing set of powers, like shape-shifting, flying, phasing, and teleporting, all thanks to her superhero rents. Now she can even join forces with her siblings to create the super pup, grow without packing on pounds, and get all semi-transparent. Plus, she's a total boss at tarot card reading, nailing future predictions and crushing it in games like Card Wars. Now Viola, Charlie's little sister, is rocking her own rad powers too. She's got teleportation, color changing, super puff transformation, and tail propeller flying abilities. Not to mention, she's a wicked good actor with some epic special effects skills, like whipping up realistic looking rain. And did I mention her killer memory? Yup, she's got that too. As for the other siblings, TV, Kim Kil Wan, and Jake Jr., they've all got their own sweet set of powers. They're doing everything from lighting up dark spaces to forming the super pups body parts and showing off some mad artistic talents. And that's pretty much all we know about the pups in the series itself. Now let's start to talk about some of the pups that may not appear in the series, but we know in fact do exist. First, do you remember Gibbon? Well, guess what? He's still alive and kicking 1,000 years in the future. Pretty wild, right? Gibbon has three crazy new powers. First, he's immortal, which explains why he's still living 1,000 years in the future. Second, he has the ability to wield pink ice, like we see in the beginning of the intro. And finally, he learned pup power extinguish but more on that later in the meantime let's kick things off with her your typical green ovular body pup herm's got this wild power called division that lets them yank their skeleton right out of their body creating two separate beings pretty rad we need some extra helpers just want to double the fun right but next up we've got jess an orange standard pup rocking a tank top and red goggles with just a tiny slit for seeing through jess has got this amazing power called holographic scribble which lets them whip up holographic art using a black bee can you imagine the mind-blowing visual they could create on a adventures, they would never get bored. Now let's talk about my favorite future pup, Raisin. A tall, standard pup with a circular tail, rainbow makeup around their eyes, and a pink horn. Raisin's power, called holy crap, is seriously intense. Their horn turns to a huge black spiral. Their body grows and gets all rainbowy, and then bam, a massive explosion wipes out everything around them. Talk about a flashy way to protect yourself. But here's where things get a little funky, and it might give us some clues about Ooh's future. From this point on, every pup's rocking the same white shirt with a logo and gets their powers snuffed out right when they're born. Does that sound familiar? That's cause it's Gibbon's signature move. Let's talk about some of these pups who gets their powers snuffed from there right when they're born. Let's start with Chris, a standard looking green skinned pup with big old spherical ears. They've got a bigger than usual horn, but their power magnets is a total mystery cause it got extinguished at birth. And yup, they're wearing that white shirt just like all the other powerless pups. Next up is Pippet, a tiny dark green pup who's all about learning their ABCs. Pippet's power astral travel is another unknown cause. You guessed it, it got extinguished at birth. And they're also sporting the white shirt. Then we've got Jim, a gray wrinkly skinned pup with long hair on their head and a pair of brown boots. Jim's power, stretch and 
legs is yet another mystery, thanks to it being extinguished at birth just like Chris and Pippet. Gonder, a standard pup with a big pink body and glasses, also had their power brain manipulator stuffed at birth. So guess what? They're wearing the white shirt just like the rest. Kingo looks kind of like Jake. With the poofy haired head where their horn sits, Kingo's power perfect eyes is unknown because, say it with me now, got God extinguished at birth. birth and they're wearing a white shirt. And finally, we've got Supremo, a pretty normal looking pup with a regular pup face, a big blue body, and a horn on their nose instead of the top of their head. But wait, Supremo's power shape-shifting ears? He gets to keep- I am just kidding, extinguished at birth. But here's where things get a little interesting again. Beth, unlike the rest, ain't sporting a white shirt. In fact, she used to be called Her Highness Batany Burrito Jackson IV, but got renamed to Beth. Her status? Lost. Exiled, fugitive, wanted, enemy of the kingdom. Seems like she's not too keen on following the crowd and falling in line with Gibbon's whole power extinguishing agenda. But what does this all really tell us? Well, it actually tells us a lot about how the future of Ooze operated. Beth used to be the pup princess and isn't anymore. Even in the opening intro, she is referred to as Beth the pup princess, which we know is not true anymore. She refused Gibbon's power of extinguishing her powers and fled the kingdom. This is a bit weird because if you're the princess, why could Gibbon still tell you what to do and still take your powers away? Well, I believe in the future of Ooze, a significant shift in power dynamics has taken place, driven by the rapid aging and evolution of the pups. Think about it. We know the pups age at an extremely accelerated rate. Who's to say that they don't evolve at that same speed? With each generation, the pups have become more powerful, which may have raised concerns for the stability of the kingdom and the rule of Gibbon, who has acquired a considerable amount of power and just achieved immortality. So now Gibbon's all freaked out by these superpowered pups getting stronger, and decides to learn this pup extinguishment power to like just totally suppress their abilities. By snuffing out the pups' power right when they're born, he makes sure they stay under his thumb and don't challenge his rule. The whole everyone wears the same white shirts thing? Yeah, that's all about keeping them in line and squashing their individuality. But as you may expect, not everyone's cool with this new way of life in Ooh. Beth, who used to be the pup princess, ain't having it. She straight up refuses to let Gibbon take her powers and bounces into exile, making her public enemy number one. But she's still got some peeps who got her back, which means there could be a whole resistance movement cooking up, looking to bring back the good old days when pups could rock their powers without worry. This whole showdown between Gibbon's crew and Beth's resistance could end up being a major deal in Ooze's future. I just did a video on how he got here, but this could be an event that happens even further in the future. We're talking a full-blown battle for power and freedom, with the kingdom's fate hanging in the balance. Will Ooze stay stuck under Gibbon's iron paw, or will it go back to being a place where everyone's unique abilities and individuality are celebrated? Only time will tell. Those magical pups had us wagging our tails with excitement, didn't they? But now it's time to shift gears from adorable moments to something a tad more heartrending because we're heading towards unraveling Martin Merton's heartbreaking truth in Adventure Time. What in the world happened to Martin Merton's Finn's dad? How did he go from being a seemingly pretty good dad to the worst dad in animation history? Well, oh boy, let me tell ya. Martin Merton's was a straight up con artist. Before he bumped into Minerva, and you know, before they made Finn, Martin was just chilling on the Hub Island, one of those human islands outside of Ooh. Our dude Martin loved making bets and getting into all sorts of shenanigans with people. At one point, he even tricked the hiders into believing he knew a secret way past the Seekers. His main goal was working for both sides. He would trick the hiders and tell the Seekers, but this time was different. Those hiders were like, nah, uh, uh you're coming with us, buddy. So after an epic fail of an escape from the island and breaking his legs, Martin found himself in the hospital. Enter Minerva Campbell, a pretty cool helper who told Martin he had one heck of a concussion and two broken legs. Our sneaky friend Martin tried to make a break for the hospital, but Minerva caught him in the act, so she had to stay overnight to keep an eye on him. But Martin was doing his Martin thing, trying to charm up Minerva, telling her he wanted to take her on a date, and she was kind of into it. The next morning, some seekers wanted to take Martin to re-education, but there was no way Martin was going to go to that. Lucky for him, Minerva lied to the seekers, saying he was in no shape to go, and they trusted her, so Martin got to stay. After that wild ride, Martin and Minerva went to dinner, fell head over heels in love, and before you know it, Minerva's pregnant and gives birth to their son, Finn Mertens. One night when baby Finn's just chilling, Minerva had to work, leaving Martin all alone with the little guy. But then, one of Martin's old enemies decided to crash the party, breaking into their home. Martin grabbed baby Finn and booked it to a raft, 
He thought he'd just circle the island, but the island guardian wasn't having it, thinking they were trying to escape. Martin told Baby Finn he'd be back for him and went full on attack mode on the island guardian. Whipping out a laser gadget, he blinded the guardian's left eye, but the guardian fought back with a huge wave. Martin and Finn separated, got lost at sea, never making it back to the island. Now get this, the next time we see Martin, like in order of events, is in the Adventure Time Distant Lands episode BMO. This one's actually set before the main series kicks off. So, BMO bumps into this guy who goes by Mr. M, and we've got a sneaky suspicion that he's none other than Martin Mertens himself. I mean, he's got those same selfish vibes Martin's known for. Spouts lines like, here comes the rascal, and at one point even says that kids always call out parents for being deadbeat. Kids, right? Always calling out their deadbeat parents. What? what? Sounds like our main man Martin, right? So what really happened between the time Martin got lost at sea and the time we see him in space aboard the Drift? Well, he ended up being picked up by some pirates after being lost at sea. How do we know this? In the promo arc for the episode Min and Marty, the episode where we get Martin and Minerva's backstory, the promo arc for the episode shows Martin Mertens with blood coming from his head aboard a pirate ship, with some pirates who look pretty concerned for the well-being of Martin, meaning that they found him after the whole island guardian situation and took him aboard their ship. But you want to know what's even crazier? Do these pirates look familiar? It's the same pirates that accompanied Tree Trunks after she left Randy and became the captain of those pirates. Just a pretty cool connection and something that we can go off of that takes place after the island incident, but before the drift. So after Martin, presumably, suffers from a concussion after getting launched by the island guardian, most people believe that he forgot his life, his wife, and his son Finn from memory loss. So he reverted back to his con man ways. But I'm not so sure because of this single line of dialogue from Martin in the episode The Visitor. I always planned to come back for you, but I didn't. That's true. It seems so genuine. Martin knew that Finn got stranded by himself. Martin remembered that he told Finn that he would be back for him, but made the conscious decision not to go after him. Also, in his story about explaining to Finn where he came from and who his mom is, it's like 50% true, but also 50% false. They were on a boat, they did encounter the island guardian, and there was actually a tiger. And when he talks about why he left Finn, about two roads diverging in the night and all that. Two roads diverging in the night. And all that. That's actually the truth. Martin's past of being a con man and his now reformed ways of living with Minerva and Finn did diverge in the night. When Widow attacked him and Finn during the night, his past life of being a con man diverged with his new family man life, living with Minerva and Finn. I don't think Martin forgot about his wife, his son, or his life as a barber at all. I think he chose to live his con man life rather than the life with Minerva and Finn, which looking at it now isn't far off from his character. That's exactly the kind of thing than Martin would do. In fact, Martin's had a concussion before and showed no signs of memory loss. Obviously, things differ case to case, and you could say a second concussion would make things a lot worse, but still, a pretty cool connection that we can make that he didn't experience any memory loss with his first concussion. Now, this is the saddest part about this, because you would think to yourself, man, Martin's got this crazy new good life. He's got a love and wife, a kid, a new job as a barber. What else could he want? But in reality, that's not what Martin wanted. He was always a con man, no matter what. He saw being stranded at sea and picked up by these pirates as an opportunity to return back to his con man life without having to suffer any of the consequences. So he took it. It's a sad reality because even though you and I would think, why would Martin ever want to go back to that life? In the end, it's what Martin wants and Martin wanted to be a con man and there was no way of changing that. And that's what leads us into the Citadel. Most people think that Martin doesn't remember Finn, hence his reaction to seemingly not knowing who Finn is when he first sees him. But think about it. Finn is way older now, and his hat is covering his hair. I just don't think Martin recognized who Finn was. Also, the first thing Martin says to Finn is escaping in Finn's Starskipper. He wanted to leave with him because he didn't know who he was. But as soon as he finds out that that is indeed Finn and his son, he wants to leave with the monsters and leave Finn behind. After Jake told Martin that Finn was his son, he remembered that he didn't want to live that life. He chose not to go back for Finn in the first place. And after seeing his son here, after all those years, 
he still doesn't want to live that life with this family. And that's pretty much Martin's entire story. Him running away. He didn't forget about Minerva or Finn or his past life on the Hub Island. He just didn't want to live that life. So he constantly ran from it. I mean, every encounter with Martin from here on out is him running away from Finn. But Finn learned to accept that. That his dad wasn't going to change. And that's the sad reality. You can't change someone to what you want them to be. It always comes down to what that person wants to be. And in Martin's case, he doesn't want to live his life with Finn and Minerva. He wanted to be a con man, constantly on the run. Wiping away a tear after Martin Burton's story? You and me both, my friend. But don't put away those tissues just yet, because we're about to trade heartache for some downright spine-tingling intrigue. Ready to uncover the disturbing truth of Dr. Gross from Adventure Time? The villains in the Adventure Time universe are already pretty stacked, but what if I told you that there's one major baddie that you are forgetting about? That's right, Dr. Gross. From her time on the human islands, right into her stay in the land of Ooh, where she carried out some of the most mind-boggling experiments. We'll uncover it all. But here's the catch. We have reasons to believe Dr. Gross might still be lurking in the shadow, pulling the strings in ways you wouldn't even imagine. The question is, are you ready to have your mind blown? Let's get started. Step into the world of Dr. Gross, a brainy bioengineer sporting some serious cyborg vibes. Picture it, living it up on a remote little nook of the world known as the Human Islands. Yeah, that's right. Human-only hideaway where folks are popping and the vibes are good. But here's the kicker. They've got a pretty hardcore no-entry, no-exit rule going down. Strict as it comes and guarded by this colossal beastie known as the Guardian. This guy's got a clear-cut mission, squashing any attempts at escaping on sight. If that wasn't gnarly enough, there's more. Meet the Seekers, some bionic superhumans handcrafted by the Gen Engineering. Their gig? Patrolling the outskirts of the islands, putting the lid on any escape artist vibes and shipping off those that give escape a shot. These trippy re-education camps. That's right, folks. Hiders don't stand a chance here. Except for Martin. But here's a zinger for you. How did our pal Dr. Gross morph into a bioengineer, huh? Break it down and it looks like the peeps who hit the bricks after the Wild Mushroom Showdown fit two molds. On one side, we've got the tech-loathing lot who've gone hugging trees and getting back to nature. Back to nature island. And then we've got the tech lover, the ones who are all about the gadget life. Enter stage right, Dr. Gross. She's clearly sailing on the tech lover's boat, mastering these machines and dialing up her engine's prowess. And here's a secret nugget for you. It's a good bet she schooled up on all this knowledge from none other than Mo. Yep, that's right. The very same whiz who cooked up our buddy Bimo. Don't believe me? Clip back to that sweet number, the island song. As those boats dock up on the island, you'll clock a blimp zipping by for a hot sec, stamped with Moco. But buckle up, because this tech fest is about to spin wildly out of whack, just you wait and see. Kick back, folks, because we've got Dr. Gross stepping onto the scene. And oh boy, does she shake things up. Picture her as the ringmaster of this wild rock, guiding a band of clueless seekers. Here's the twist. She's cooked up these freaky implants that nestle right into their noggins. And you're thinking, cool, they're gonna direct a brain feed of info, right? Hold on to your hats because here's the crazy part. These implants are just smoking mirrors. They give Dr. Gross the puppet stream, letting her play the Seekers like a gnarly cosmic fill without their consent. One of these Seekers who's in for this wild ride is a kid, Kara Strong, or more professionally, Seeker XJ77, which also Susan Strong. But that's pretty crazy, right? She's a believer, you know, living in this paradise they call the islands. Outside world? Forget about it. We're talking monsters, illness, total chaos. But here comes the twist. Frida, Kira's top tier friend, she's an engineer, right? She wants to see the whole crazy wide world. Frida, she's the secret escape artist, hatching a scheme to bounce from the islands. And what does Kira do? Does she blow the whistle? No. She gets in on the action, decides to throw a helping hand. But here's where the gears grind. Enter Dr. Gross. Discovered the little plan, didn't she? And then, woof, using the implanted gizmo, she forces Kira to bust her best bud, Frida, against her own will. Frida's captured, bounced over to some re-education program, never tries to make the escape plan again, and starts making toys instead. This is our first sign of Dr. Gross showing no ethical boundaries, as she can control her students without their consent. But it would only get worse from here. Dr. Gross, right? This super brainy gal who's really pushing the envelope with her lab work, really getting stuck into her experiments, always thirsty for more of that sweet, sweet knob. But here's the kicker. She's not exactly playing by the rule book. Taking in all those yawn-worthy safety regs and ethical lines in the sand might just be me, but that sounds like a pretty gnarly path to be treaded. Feel me? Dr. Gross is totally set on figuring out her craft's aid to Z, right? So what does she do? She starts to tinker with these super risky bio stuff, getting closer and closer to the danger zone. Then boom, in a blink, she lets loose this killer virus. And it's like wildfire across the islands. But even as things are going south real quick on the island, she doesn't hit the brakes. Nah, her experiments just keep on getting gnarlier and gnarlier, crossing all sorts of ethical lines. The only reason she was able to do all these wild experiments was thanks to it falling in the shell shock era when Minerva Campbell, yeah, the one who was all about lending a helping hand, was swimming in a sorry sea of sorrow. Picture it, folks. Her husband Martin's gone, AOL, taking their baby boy Finn with him, left her in real tatters, melting down in a major emotional mess. Our dear Minerva was too caught up in her heartbreak
fabric to keep tabs on her day job. And that's where it gets spicy, folks. In comes Dr. Gross, taking full advantage of Minerva's heartbreak, doing wacky experiments with no one to hold her back. So get this. The virus goes full ham, right? It wipes out like more than half of all humans and 100% of the helpers. I mean, yikes. That's some gnarly stuff, isn't it? So naturally, our morally questionable bioengineer lady decides to say peace out to the islands, up and leaves in her high-tech only go lab and lands right smack dab in the land of Oo. Now residing in the land of Oo, Dr. Gross is still grinding away in her lab, digging deep into like the crossroads of tech and biology. Things are leveling up in a big way as her experiments are growing in complexity and scale. Doesn't even look like she's batting an eyelid about any ethics or potential bummer outcomes. It's like she's found this crazy kind of synchrony between the organic and metal parts. And oh boy, is she pumped to stretch these limits. Let's see how wild the doc's gonna turn this tech bio mashup, shall we? Now picture this, a monster of a robotic ship buried smack dab in the middle of Utopia. That's her playground. And trust me, it's a wild testament to her genius and her quirks. It's chock full of magical scientific marvels with a sprinkle of downright bizarre mixes of life and technology. Now, don't get it twisted. This isn't just some static lab we're talking about. No sir, really. This beast has got its moves. It can go up, down, wherever she wants, all in a sweet blink. Imagine that. It's like something out of a wild comic book, right? Well, get used to it, folks, because this isn't just a fantasy. It's her reality. So Dr. Gross would just be chilling day and night in the guts of this wickedly twisty mega machine, right? Practically drowning in comps and some seriously gnarly gear. Main thing on this gal's plate? Messing around with animals and cooking up crazy cool mix em up being that just spilled out from the depths of her wicked rafty and all right, slightly tweaked out brain box. She'd whip up combos like shark mice, which are pretty much as wild as they sound. And even bears that could tell you the time. No joke. In fact, this bear that could tell you the time would end up playing a pretty big role in Ben and Jake's lives later on. Each creation was like its own thing, intriguing as a heck, but not gonna lie, definitely meant raising an eyebrow or two. Whoa, hold up. Dr. Gross, enthusiastic? Yeah, you heard me right. Her animated energy just seemed to light up a room though. You gotta believe that her vibrant vibes dance in some wacky contrast with the extreme nature of her experience. Now, she's thinking, these cyborg add-ons I'm slapping on these creatures? Yeah, they're upgrades, no doubt about it. Like, they're the next big step in evolution or something. But see here, this twisted POV just throws into sharper relief how out of touch she is with the actual ethical uh-ohs hanging over her work. It's pretty crazy, right? So, she whipped up this wacky bond with Tiffany. Yes, Tiffany. This dude who was once a heavy problem for Finn and Jake. And after all, Finn thought Tiffany was dead after the whole worm thing. But he's back. She's got this mad knack for gadgetry, so she hooked him up with this gnarly mechanical arm after past beef left him lacking in the limb department. The thing is, Tiffany, he didn't just take this sweet upgrade and peace out. Nope. He stuck around. Became her number one helper. Her go-to sidekick. He was all in, totally buying what she was selling, completely down for her grand scheme. Dr. Gross, breezing into ooh, stirred up a pretty wild mix of curiosity and the creeps. I'm talking unmatched tech skills and a seriously bonkers lack of ethical check marks let her bust through barriers nobody else would dare touch. Finn and Jake get wind of her antics while nosing around in Butopia and bam, they stumble smack into her lab. A close shave with Dr. Gross's operating table has them booking it out of there. And in the boom that follows, the lab's toast and a bunch of animal hybrids are let loose to run wild in ooh. Although the lab is destroyed and seemingly Dr. Gross went down with it, Dr. Gross's impact would be far from over. In fact, there might even be signs of Dr. Gross still being alive. But back to the action in the center of ooh. The echoes of Dr. Gross's doings are still making waves, setting off a domino effect that's gonna flip the script for everyone caught up in it. Take for instance, our buddy Clock Bear. You know, that bear that could tell the time? This being was one of the many hybrid animal creations of good old Dr. Gross. And after Finn, Jake, and Susan busted him out, he just drifted off into the vast expanses of ooh. But hold up, this isn't the final curtain call for Clock Bear. Nope, he's set to come back with a bang, playing a mega role in the unfolding stories of our dynamic duo Finn and Jake. Let me break it down for you. This saga kicks off in the agent workplace of our deal pals Joshua and Mark. This patch of real estate is now under the watchful eye of Kim Kilwan. The dude sends out one of his boys, a chap named Rennie Ham, over to do a little snooping around the property, but plot twist. Rennie comes back and he's all shook up, scared out of his wits by whatever he bumped into. Now our bro Kim Kilwan is way curious and he decides it's time to bring in the big guns. So where does he turn? Straight to Finn and Jake, our adventurous duo. He's like, hey guys, I need you to do your thing. Get this old office the once over and suss out what's rattling Rennie's cage. Finn and Jake roll up thinking, hey, we might be in for a showdown with our parents' spirit. But oh man, they got slapped with something way beefier. It was pretty much a blast from the past up in there, full of this trippy time jumping shenanigans, throwing up crazy illusions of the duo as ankle biters and all these old school moments. And man, don't even get me started on the ticking sound. Loud and clear, screaming time slip ahead dudes. Wait till you hear this. Jake, prepped in his like cooking armor, found himself eyeballing his own birth. Yup, utterly bananas, if you ask me. I kid you not, that's how it 
all went down. Well, hey, these so-called time slips weren't just run-of-the-mill sneak peeks of days gone by. No, these encounters were mashing it up with the here and now in ways that had Finn and Jake taking a serious look-see at their world. Picture it, Finn's right there and holding many versions of himself and his bros, right? And these baby dudes were clocking him, serving as the link between what was and what is. Got it? They're connecting the past and present dots. So as it turns out, the root cause of all this time loop weirdness was, surprise, surprise, our buddy Clockbear. No biggie, right? Just under the weather. The same Clockbear whipped up by the whiz Dr. Gross, mind you. When we gave the guy a bit of a wind-up, poof, all these mind-bending time slips vanished. Just like that, we're back to the ordinary humdrum of our trusty old office. Now, before the dust fully settled, our pal Jake had this super crucial run-in with Shapeshifter. I'm talking about Warren Ampersand here. This dude goes and paints Jake all blue and even makes a tiny portal for him to skip out, and eventually led to Jake finding out who his real dad actually is. While the repercussions of Dr. Gross's actions are pretty deeply felt in Ooh, they also open up new paths and possibilities for the characters. Jake's terrifying but somewhat enlightening encounter with Warren Ampersand, Finn's emotional message to his parents, and their shared understanding of the time slips. All of these are like signals, you know? Pointing out Dr. Gross's impact on the scene. Stuff's changed. Things have taken a turn. And our adventure pals are right at the heart of it, thanks to Dr. Gross. Now, remember back when I fired a theory your way about the potential for Dr. Gross still kicking it, right? Picture this. Tiffany played the martyr, putting the brakes on Dr. Gross's madcap experiments, queuing up the sweet exit for our pals Finn, Jake, and Susan from the lab. When this joint goes boom, it's Tiffany and Dr. Gross stuck in the thick of it, all right? Now get this. Peep the come along with me outro seats and spot a surprise guest, our homie Tiffany. Except hang on, sporting some extra shiny bionic upgrades. Gnarly, ain't it? So let's connect the dots here. Dr. Gross must have survived the blow up alongside Tiffany and really buried the hatchet, it seems, since she hooked Tiffany up with a bang a new upgrade. But dude, don't get too comfy. There's one massive question still hanging. Like seriously, what's the next wild brainstorm Dr. Gross has penned down on her wacky to-do list, huh? And if she actually made it out of live, you know the drill. She doesn't exactly chill out with her crazy curiosity and non-stop testing. This brings to a whole new set of questions, one that's burning a hole in our brains. Like what wild transformations in the land of Ooh is in for thanks to Dr. Gross. We're grabbing about a gal who pulled off some pretty bonkers biology experiments, whipping up hybrids right out of a storybook, and leaving a mark so colossal, it's still calling the shots in the land of Ooh. So who knows what could be next? But whatever it is, you can bet your life Dr. Gross is going to whip up something super risky and way over the good doctor line. Super unethical. She's got that down to a T. So while we've explored the technological genius and morale and bigwitty of Dr. Gross today, it's worth noting that she wasn't the only human who managed to survive the mushroom apocalypse from the land of Ooh. There's another figure, shrouded in mystery, who spent centuries isolated on a desolate island. A story interwoven with heartbreak and resilience. Have you ever wondered about the puzzling character of Alva? Her chilling solitude and her tireless quest for human contact. We'll delve into the tragic story of Alva, where we unravel her mysterious past and discover how she fits into the grand saga of Adventure Time. Prepare yourself to witness an intriguing narrative that'll make you question what it means to be truly alone. Ulva's tale is one that's filled with unexpected turns and heart-tugging moments. It's a gripping saga of survival, resilience, and the harsh realities of nature. From her solitary existence on a heavily modified island to her intricate relationship with Finn, every scene with Alva overflows with meaning and mystery. It's a journey through an island that refuses to be tamed, and a character that embraces it, flourishing amidst the chaos. In this video, we're diving deep into the tragic story of Ulva from Adventure Time. Prepare for a ride full of discoveries and insights about this remarkable character and the island she calls home. Also, if you're new here, see my content before, or just like Adventure Time, please subscribe. I won't babble on any longer let's get into the video. But first, I need to give you a little recap of the events leading up to Alva's discovery. Picture the scene. Finn, our beloved hero, wakes up stranded on a mysterious island having been capsized by the Guardian. There's a palpable sense of trepidation and confusion in the air, underscored by Finn's isolation and his confronting wave, a symbol of his past fear, the ocean. The feeling is eerily dreamlike, almost surreal, but it's not a dream. The wave hits and everything's alright. The dread dissipates, but the mystery deepens. This powerful opening scene doesn't just plunge us into the suspense of a new set, it establishes the fundamental theme of the episode, the cycles of nature and its stark indifference. From here, we're about to embark on a journey that explores survival, transformation, and the bittersweet poignancy of last stands. As Finn grapples with the swift shifts in the island's microclimate, from a snowy clifftop cabin to a sudden hot desert, and confronts bewildering local wildlife, it becomes clear that he is in a realm that defies his past experiences and survival instincts. As Finn ventures deeper into the forest, he comes across an animal that got trapped in a cage. Finn, being the hero that he is, tries to help the animal out, but it turns out that Finn was the one who ended up being trapped. Which leads us to the big question, who lives on this island and sets up these traps? A being who looks human walks into brain. This is Ulva. It turns out Ulva is actually
a human like Finn. And Finn has tons of questions like how does Ulva even live in these conditions on the island? Which is quickly found as a super powerful storm starts to brew in the distance. Alva doesn't seem bothered though. She just quickly retreats into her tree which from the outside looks like it stands absolutely zero chance against the storm. However, once on the inside, it's fortified to the max and even has an underground bunker which Alva goes down and Finn follows. This is where it's finally revealed as to what happened to Alva and how she appears to be the only human left on this island. She shows Finn her tapes which documents her journey on this island. To truly understand the significance of Alva's journey, we need to delve into the past of this. The narrative through Alva's tape reveals that this island wasn't always so alien and merciless. Once the serene and hospital place was home to a community of humans intent on using technology to bend the island's weather patterns to their whim. This idyllic haven was a testament to human ingenuity, transforming the island's environment to create their desired microclimates. But as we all know, nature isn't one to be tamed easily. The human settlers' attempts to manipulate the weather systems soon backfired. Their efforts resulted in the creation of new and unpredictable weather sites, many of which were far from friendly. This uncontrolled fusion of technology and nature led to a chaotic environment that proved dangerous and deadly. The once confident settlers found themselves at the mercy of the wild climate they had inadvertently birthed. In a twist of cruel irony, the back to nature experiment that the humans undertook turned into their worst nightmare. The pearliest weather cycles, coupled with the island's mess and wildlife, became the harbingers of death for the island's settlers. Their dreams of a microclimate utopia collapsed under the relentless wrath of nature. All their efforts and hopes were shattered, leaving behind a haunting testament to their failed experiment. But this begs the question, why did Ulva and the other humans end up on this island in the first place? Well, something that really helps answer this is the fact that we know the island's name, as said by Martin. We also know that Back to Nature Island was the last of the four islands to be colonized. Knowing that gives us some valuable insight. It suggests a sequence of failed attempts to create human colonies on other islands. Each of these attempts may have had their own set of challenges and failures, leading the humans to continually search for a more suitable habitat. The name Back to Nature Island itself implies an intention to return to a simpler, pre-industrial, pre-magic way of life. Perhaps the human colonizers had observed the negative impacts of their past attempts at using technology to control their environment, as seen on the other islands. This could have led them to adopt a philosophy of living more harmonious with nature, hoping this approach would ensure their survival where their other colonies had failed. However, even though they sought to embrace nature and live in a more primitive fashion, they found themselves unable to fully relinquish the comforts and control that technology provided. They attempted to use technology in a controlled manner to modify the weather and create hospitable microplants, showing a compromise between their desire for a natural existence and their reliance on technology. Unfortunately, the consequences of this intervention were catastrophic. They created an unstable environment and incurred the wrath of the native wildlife, leading to their eventual downfall. This could be seen as a tragic illustration of the challenges and pitfalls of trying to balance a natural existence with the use of technology. Out of the island's tragic history emerges Alva, the sole survivor of the human settlement, living in harmony with the wild cycles of the island. In an encounter that tugs at the heartstrings, Alva crosses paths within. Although her exterior suggests an indifferent and hardened woman, her actions speak louder, revealing a woman who has accepted her fate, adapted to the harsh elements, and has made the islands her home. Their communication barrier does nothing to hinder the connection between them. Alva's Swedish falls on Finn's uncomprehending ears, yet he persists, attempting to establish a link. Alva's quiet stoicism stands in stark contrast to Finn's boisterous curiosity, creating a captivating dynamic between the two characters. This scene in particular, where Finn constantly talks and asks questions, even though Alva can't understand him, beautifully highlights Finn's struggle against the flow of the island's rhythm, causing a humorous yet poignant friction. What we see in Alva's character is a mirror of the island's impassives, sculpted by her daily battles against nature and solitude. A lifetime of isolation has transformed her into a woman of few words, only speaking when necessary, a stark contrast to Finn's chatty nature. Her hardened exterior, however, doesn't hide the soft spot she has for Finn as she goes out of her way to help him, leading him, guiding him in their shared quest for survival. These interactions between Finn and Alva, full of non-verbal communication and shared experiences paints a heartwarming picture of their brief companionship. While the narrative teems with danger and dread, it's their relationship that infuses the episode with a sense of warmth and connection, demonstrating the resilience of the human spirit in the face of adversity. Survival on the island, as it turns out, is more than just battling the harsh weather and untamed wilderness. It's about bending to nature's capricious whims and learning to coexist with it. This theme of survival is perfectly epitomized in the character of Alva, who, despite the tragic annihilation of her community, 
community adapts and thrives amidst the brutal cycles of the island. Over the years, she's become a part of the island's ecosystem, living in harmony with the very forces that brought about her solitude. Alva's innovative approach to survival is showcased in her humble dwelling, a tree that appears organic on the outside, but reveals a metallic interior equipped with advanced weatherproof technology. This marvel of survival engineering stands as a testament to human ingenuity and adaptability, creating a safe haven amidst the unforgiving wilderness of the land. The storm scene is particularly illuminated, highlighting the severity of the island's unpredictable weather cycles and how well Alva has adapted to it. Her composed demeanor in the face of imminent danger suggests a profound understanding and acceptance of the island's rhythms. As the storm rages outside, Alva, safe within her metallic shelter, projects a tranquil defiance, embodying the very essence of survival on the island. Her survival strategy extends beyond physical security. The silent film she shows Finn offers a poignant insight into her past and the island's history, highlighting the importance of understanding and respecting nature. Despite the bitter memories it surely holds, the film helps her remember her roots and the vital lessons learned from their disastrous attempts to control nature. It's a reminder of the resilience of human spirit and a testament to her strength. Through Alva, we learn that survival on the island isn't about conquest or control, but about finding harmony with nature and adapting to its inexorable cycles. Her journey stands as a poignant reminder of our intrinsic connection with the natural world and the need for respect and humility in our attempts to manipulate. The gripping tale of Alva's survival on a volatile, untamed island in the Adventure Time universe, an island that once held the dreams of human settlers seeking a back-to-nature existence, but instead spiraled into a powerful testament to nature's unpredictable force. In a cruel twist of fate, it became a haunting ground, narrating the story of failed attempts to manipulate nature and the resultant chaos. Yet amidst this, we find a beacon of resilience and adaptability. Alva, she exemplifies how survival is not about controlling the elements, but finding a way to exist harmoniously amidst her acceptance of the island's caprices, her efforts to adapt to its unforgiving conditions, and the relationship she formed with Finn, despite the language barrier, all encapsulate a truly inspiring survival story. We just took a deep, emotional plunge with Alva's tearjerker of a tail, didn't we? But wipe those eyes and prep that nostalgic heart, because guess what's coming up? We're about to bounce into, drumroll please, the forgotten best episode of Adventure Time. Season 9 episode 1, titled Orb from Adventure Time, is massively underrated and one of the most thought-provoking episodes of Adventure Time. I just feel like it doesn't get talked about enough compared to the likes of Hall of Egress or Jake the Brick. There's still a lot to decipher from this episode, and in this video, I'm going to try my very best to make sense of it. But first, I need to bring up an important term that is used a lot throughout the entire episode. Foreshadowing. Basically, foreshadowing means when the writers give you hints or clues about what's going to happen in the future, and Adventure Time is no stranger to foreshadow. <laughs> but this episode does it a lot, which you might be able to pick up on as I give you the little recap of this episode. So let's jump in. But first, if you're new to my channel or you've seen it before, please subscribe. In all seriousness, if you enjoy Adventure Time or my content in general, hit the subscribe button. It really helps. But for this time, let's jump in. The episode opens post-hub island drama with Finn, Jake, and Bimo floating back home on their boat. It's bedtime and Bimo's on story duty, but instead of an epic tale, our little robot gets distracted by a strange cloud tailing them. There is a strange cloud following us. Come and see. It's fine. I'm sure ominous clouds following adventure boats at sea are super normal. Anyway, Bimo's short story is apparently so captivating they all snooze off. On to the dream sequence buffet. We start with Jake's sitcom-styled homecoming dream. His dad Joshua and brother Jermaine make an appearance. I can see where this is going. <laughs> Yes, you heard it right, Jermaine's dream share. Jermaine's taken up landscape painting because nothing screams adventurous dream like a hobby and stationary artistry. Jake proposes a collab, but Jermaine firmly shuts it down. Uh, that's not really my scene, man. I'm into real things. Transitioning to Finn's dream, it's a joyride in the sky where water nymphs apparently sculpt cloud art in their free time. I made these cloud sculptures for you. Yes! We've got Minerva's head, a Finn sword, and a Jake head. Now if that doesn't scream, I need therapy, I don't know what does. Jake's head turns out to be the dream equivalent of a cloud club, hosting party god and some bananas. Maybe it's just Finn's subconscious fear of running out of boat bananas. Or maybe it's something way deeper, but more on that later. Now onto Bimo's dream, which is like a fever dream, cross between a surreal talk show and Food Network. Bimo's directing a sitcom with Mobots as actors and food items as the audience. I love 
some art. But before you think it's all about BMO's dream of fame, look closer. BMO doesn't interact with its reflection as it's coming up the elevator, which is super weird. The entire series we've seen BMO interact with its reflection as football, but this time it's different. This will be a key point later on, so keep your detective glasses on. As we get a little intro to these crazy dreams to come, we cut back to the trio sleeping on the boat. Now I hope you're ready for this twist. The strange cloud is actually a creepy black orb. Good night, weird orb. It's hovering over our sleeping trio. Things just got real, or as real as they can get in a dream sequence. Now let's get into the real meat and potatoes of this episode and try to make sense of what some of these dream sequences mean for our lovable main characters than Jake and Bimo. This is where Jake's dream sequence catapults us from quirky to, holy cow, did the writers fall into an existential crisis mid-script? This time, Jake and his brother Jermaine find themselves on a puzzling quest by their dad Joshua to dig a hole in the kitchen. What's this supposed to symbolize? A subconscious deep dive into their lives or identities, their untapped purposes. But hey, let's remember, it's in the kitchen, the belly of the home, indicating that this quest might be hitting them right in the fields. As they're digging, they spot mysterious footprints on the ceiling. This might suggest Jake grappling with unresolved questions, possibly related to his extraterrestrial background. They're on the ceiling, implying Jake might need a step stool or, you know, a new perspective to solve these riddles. Then plot twist, they've accidentally buried their dad in the hole they dug. Now I know we've all wanted to bury our problems before, but this is next level. Is this an unconscious desire to bury the past or are they feeling the weight of their dad's expectations? Or maybe it's just guilt for literally burying their father in the kitchen floor. Next up, they spot their mother Margaret whipping up a delightful bowl of worms. The creepy crawly cookery could highlight Jake's fear of stirring up his deeply buried anxieties. Margaret cradling Jake, however, swiftly goes from a Hallmark moment to a Halloween nightmare as she morphs into the moon and starts to snack on his blood. This might signify Jake's fear of his mom going from nurturing to nightmares. Also, let's not forget, Margaret isn't Jake's birth mother, leading to a whole therapy session worth of damage for Jake. Jermaine then decides he's had enough and jumps ship, fleeing into his painting, symbolizing his decision to abandon the burdens and expectations associated with his family to pursue his personal path of self actualization Remember, he did let the family house burn down without so much as a bucket of water. Jake, though, stays put, now appearing very old and wrinkly. He's obviously paying the price for trying to meet his father's expectations. In the final act of this domestic drama, we see a depleted Jake looking as though he'd been run over by a bus of emotional turmoil, whimpering at his beaming parents. His desperation for approval and fear of disappointing his parents is palpable, emphasizing the alienation he feels due to his unique heritage. I feel like Jake is in constant approval from his parents because he feels like he isn't actually their child. Yes, he was birthed by Joshua, but I feel like he feels that he'll always just be an alien to them. He'll never be a real pup like Jermaine, and I think he always wants to prove to his parents that he can be a normal pup. But as the scene concludes, we're left with Jake looking as emotionally hungover as ever, wrestling with the anxieties of who he is and where he's heading. Or maybe he's just upset that he ruined the kitchen floor. You know, either or. But get your popcorn ready folks because Finn's dream is back for round two. This time, he bumps into PB, our lovable bubblegum monarch. Now if you've been keeping track, you'll remember that the last time Finn had mastered the art of dream flight. However, this time, he's stuck. He can't fly in front of PB like he could literally minutes ago. Not only that, but some grass roots from him start wrapping around his feet. Maybe they symbolize Finn's lingering attachments to PB and Ooh. Despite being an adventurer, the grassroots, quite literally, keep pulling him back home. Remember when Finn declined the comments offer for an existential makeover in the comment episode? As Finn put it, I feel like I put a lot of work into this meat reality. I'd like to see it through. Now that's what I call commitment. Or you know, maybe it's that grass guy. Yeah, fern. But I don't know. Let me know what you think about the grass truth in the comments. In the dream, like I said before, he fails to impress PB with his flyboy antics, perhaps exposing a lingering fear of inadequacy. Is he forever doomed to be the little boy who could never quite make the grade in PB's eyes? Maybe it's old relationship baggage, or maybe he's just terrified of not living up to the expectations of those he loves. That's pretty deep. Next, PB's dental drama unfolds. This could suggest a classic stress dream scenario. Losing teeth is often seen as a symbol for powerlessness or loss of control, and considering PB is in charge of an entire kingdom, she might want to consider a mouth guard. Could Finn be stressed about the future of the Candy Kingdom and PB's ability to rule? His frantic efforts to reattach her teeth could reflect his fear of failing in his duty as the guardian or his struggle to understand PB's actions and their impact on the kingdom. Suddenly, Finn gets swallowed by the ground. Wait, backrooms reference? Finn is in the backrooms, confirmed. Can't pixels with bedtime bit? Sorry, sorry, I'll stop. 
but Bimo's dream isn't over yet either. And Bimo's dream might be the most odd. Sorry, that's that's a lie. Jake's dream is still the most odd. So remember how Bimo's dream started with a dramatic performance by two Mobots cosplaying Finn and Jake, painting a future that looked grimmer than a rainy Monday without Bimo? This might just be Bimo's egocentric subconscious craving to be the hero his friends can't do without. It also highlights Bimo's aspirations to direct the course of his world, or maybe just pull his strings behind an epic puppet show. Same thing, really. However, dreams, much like my bank account balance, often have a darker side. Enter Amo, Bimo's evil sibling. Amo gate crashes the dream drama, impersonating Bimo, serving as a hot plate of Bimo's fears. The core fear turning into an A-grade self-centered jerk like Amo. If his desire for importance ran rampant, the plot thickens when football and Amo, disguised as false directors, take the helm, reflecting Bimo's worry that his dark side might run the show. Remember when I said that football wasn't in the reflection earlier? Well, this is it. It turns out football is an entirely different being in Bimo's dream. The dream turns into a symbolic parade, featuring everything from Jake's aging to a cameo from the lich-faced Amo. This could signal Bimo's fear of the unstoppable ticking clock and the persistent lurking of evil. Particularly the lich, taking control of Bimo in dreamland could be a nod towards Sweet Pea's future role in the narrative. No two sweet characters could cause such drama. Also, let's not ignore the dream's nods to Bimo's innocence, like his whimsical snack food landscape. Considering Bimo doesn't need to eat and that food can't talk, these delectable elements are a testament to his pure imagination and the unique way he views the world. And here's where things kick up a notch. All of their dreams intersect, turning into a joint nightmare. Instead of Bimo directing two Mobots playing Finn and Jake, now we've got the actual Finn and Jake on stage under Bimo's control. It's like an Adventure Time dreamception. Now we're back in the dreamscape where Jake's grappling with becoming a relic. On stage, the Mo declares, Your brother's gonna have to step up his game to keep up with you, or everyone's gonna know you're too old to play Jake. But I am Jake. <laughs> A brutal reminder of Jake's fear that growing older means losing his swag. After all, no one wants to be seen as that guy who's trying too hard to be hit. Add to that the fact that his best bud Finn, who usually looks up to Jake for guidance, is growing up faster than he is. It's like running a race where Finn's zooming ahead and Jake's just puffing behind. Then plot twist, they all realize they're co-starring in the same night and the ground beneath them crumbles. As they plunge into this abyss, foreshadowing the impending elemental chaos, we see some easter eggs that might have slipped under your radar. Take a closer look when the floor smashes, and you'll see a red figure on the moon to the left. Gold? Is that you, buddy? Then there's the Fire Kingdom volcano with ears suspiciously like Finn's hat and a blindfold across its face. A shout out to the Hall of Egress episode, perhaps? As they're free falling, this creepy eye cloud floats around them. Finn MacGyver's address and bat wings onto the cloud, which promptly sprouts limbs and halts their plummet. This turns out to be Nightmare Princess, who apparently is the reason for this slumber party from their nightmares. After this, the dreamscape just goes nuts with weird visuals, like when Finn labels her as some kind of nightmare princess or suddenly surrounded by a crab-like invasion. This might be a throwback to the Breezy episode, where Finn copes with his lost arm by smooching a ton of princesses, and he starts with Crab Princess. That sight of Finn, that used all these princesses as just a way to get over his arm, is a nightmare for him, and something that he never wants to go back to. Another intriguing scene is when Bimo starts growing up while laying in his bed, quickly outgrows it, and then shrinks back down. This could be Bimo's nightmare of growing up and growing apart from Finn and Jake. Honestly, there's a butt load more symbolism in this segment, and I won't pretend to understand it all. Kind of like how I feel about modern art, but hey, if you have any theories, please drop them in the comments below. As we wave goodbye to the fever dream that was this episode, Nightmare Princess requests all the bananas on the ship. Emo, in a business move that could rival any Wall Street tycoon, trades them for something pretty and or cool. They snap back to reality, the orb goes all Kirby on the remaining bananas, and in true infomercial fashion, hands Finn some mysterious concoction before floating off. And oh boy, does this end up stirring the pot in the finale. Suddenly, Jake spots what he thinks is ooh in the yonder, but when Bimo plays pirate with the spyglass, the landscape is far from familiar. Finn asks what's out there, Bimo replies, Like a dream. And just like that, folks, we're strapped in for the Elements miniseries. While we're basking in the glory of rediscovered gems, why not hop onto the express train to yet another tale of wonder. Here we go. Next stop, the incredible story of Bimo from Adventure Time. I love Bimo, but our quirky little living video game system has a tale that's as intriguing as it gets. Now, Bimo may come off as a charming little character with a simple storyline, but oh boy, you're in for a surprise. Their journey kicks off in one heck of an episode, Bimo. Let's crack this nut. We all remember that wild Adventure Time episode, Bimo, right? Our little Bimo buddy took the spot 
spotlight. Things got real when Finn and Jake pulled up loops and wiped out some of BMO's core system files. Now what? Off to the Mo factory we go, the place where BMO got his start. So here's where things get interesting. BMO's creator was none other than Mosif Mo Giovanni, the last human standing before Finn showed up. Mo whipped up a whole series of robots, each with a special gig. And BMO, short for be more, pretty catchy huh? Our dude was built to be all about the fun. Their grand mission? To spread joy and good vibes among humans. So Finn and Jake played dress up, going full robot mode in the factory. They cross paths with other Mo's and get the lowdown on BMO's backstory. And in classic Adventure Time style, chaos ensues. Finn and Jake get busted, but who saves the day? Our main man, BMO. By the time the credits roll, our digital buddy is back to full operating mode and Finn and Jake, they're looking at their living game console with a whole new level of respect. But wait, there's even more. What happened after BMO got the green light from Mo to spread joy in the world? Well, my friends, that's where we segue into the epic Distant Land special BMO. Are you ready for another adventure? Let's get started. Alrighty, folks, time to strap in because we're venturing into the cosmic chronicle of BMO of the stellar episode from Adventure Time Distant Lands. BMO starring as our main dude, hopping galaxies and landing himself smack dab in the middle of a whole heap of cosmic chaos. Kicking things off, our adventurous BMO is all set to transform Mars into something awesome. And this is what happened after Mo sent out BMO to terraform Mars. But plot twist, he gets rerouted to a struggling space station, the Drift, by a pint-sized robot he names Olive. BMO stepping onto the Drift and runs into a rabbit scavenger Y4 and encourages her to embrace her true self. So Y4 steps up, rebrands herself Y5, and thus unfolds the tale of BMO's kindness and knack for inspiring others to be true to themselves. As the tale unravels, our beloved BMO becomes a major player in uncovering Hugo, the leader of the Drift, and his shady secrets. Hugo's right-hand man, Mr. M, who is most likely Martin Mertens, which I did a video about, ditches BMO in a pretty gnarly jungle pod, but BMO's got friends in Y5 and another bot, Seago. They piece together Hugo's grand scheme for using the Drift's tech for personal gain without a thought for the other residents. BMO and Y5 manage to blow Hugo's cover, but the crafty dude gives them the slip, making off with a bulk of the Drift's resources. Now, the real kicker comes with BMO's big return to Earth. After putting a stop to Hugo's grand getaway, BMO rallies everyone to band together and save the Drift. Despite the heavy hit they've taken, the inhabitants decide to rebuild, and BMO rides out on a space lard. He crash lands near a familiar treehouse with a young Finn and Jake goofing around, dropping a bomb. This whole episode is a prequel to the main series. Pretty mind-blowing, right? Now we've walked the cosmic path with BMO, leading us right back to the classic Adventure Time series. And even though our BMO buddy pops up right from the get-go in the series intro, his true big day he was in the business time episode. Let the games begin. Are you ready for a blast from the past? We're taking a trip down memory lane with business time. Brace yourselves, because things are about to get frosty with Finn and Jake bumping into four businessmen frozen solid in an iceberg. After thawing them out, they find these dudes are like productivity on steroids, so our main duo puts them to work on their adventure agenda. Here's where it gets interesting. As these suit and tie guys start to take on more of Finn and Jake's tasks, our heroes find themselves with heaps of spare time. And what better way to spend it than by kicking back with some ice cream and giving BMO a run for their money with a couple of video games. Among the gaming gems, they delve into Pro Football 1861, a quirky game with a nod to Abraham Lincoln. So BMO is making their big debut as Finn and Jake's go-to gaming console. And this is just the beginning, folks. Throughout the series, BMO shines as the perfect sidekick to our adventurous duo, offering a mix of entertainment and much needed help on their epic quests. This episode marks the kickoff of this grand dynamic. But hold up, this is just the tip of the iceberg. BMO's character is a treasure trove of quirks and charm that's yet to be fully explored. But we get a deeper peek into BMO's world in the episode 5 short Grables. Trust me, you're in for a real treat for this one. This episode is like a showcase of BMO's wild imagination and what it does when it's home alone. Picture this, Finn and Jake are out, and BMO's got the tree fort all to itself. So what's the first thing BMO does? Runs straight to the bathroom, locks the door, and ensures it's all alone. Next, it starts a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with its reflection, introducing us to its imaginary friend, football. Now, for those with an eagle eye for details, you might remember spotting a small drawing of football in the Distant Land special BMO. Even though, chronologically speaking, football was part of BMO's life before the main Adventure Time series, this episode is when we first meet football in the series itself. Next, BMO goes all in to show football that it's a real living boy. This includes mimicking, brushing its teeth, scrubbing itself with soap, and even trying to pee, albeit pretty awkwardly, since it's all make-believe. And here's the kicker. Unbeknownst to BMO, Finn and Jake are secretly keeping tabs on its antics, even checking off proof that BMO does weird junk when nobody's around from their to-do list. So what's the takeaway here? This episode gives us a peek into BMO's rich imagination, which becomes a key aspect of the series moving forward, from its conversations with imaginary friend football to its attempts to imitate human behaviors. BMO exhibits a unique blend of imaginative play and a longing for human experiences despite being a robot. This glimpse into BMO's personality sets the stage for more in-depth
in-depth exploration in future storylines, making Bimo one of the most loved characters in the Adventure Time universe. But trust me, we're just scratching the surface of Bimo's wild imagination here. We get a much deeper dive into Bimo's creative mind in the episode Bimo Noir. Buckle up, because it's going to be a wild ride. Here we go. We're diving into the episode Bimo Noir, where our lovable Bimo takes center stage as a detective trying to solve the mystery of Ben's missing sock. The episode is styled like a classic film noir, with Bimo playing the part of the shrewd detective. Now picture this, Finn's sock goes missing, and he has a minor spat with Jake about it. Bimo, eager to help, steps up to find the missing sock, and embarks on an investigation that could put Sherlock Holmes to shame. Bimo first grills Ronnie, who's in a picture of Finn's foot with Bimo snapped earlier. Ronnie denies any sock napping, but points out a grape juice stain on the sock in the picture. Bimo, however, uncovers that the grape juice is still unopened, and so concludes that Ronnie was lying. Despite Officer Davis's warnings to stop playing detective, Bimo drops by Lorraine's place, hoping she can shed some light on Ronnie's whereabouts. Lorraine claims she's clueless about the sock, but a slip in conversation reveals she knows the sock belongs to Finn, leading her to confess that Bebe was the actual thief. Bimo then tracks Bebe down to a dance club and confronts him about the sock. Bebe pleads innocent, causing Bimo to accuse him of being sold out by Lorraine. After a misstep which leads to Bimo blacking out, Bimo wakes up to find Bebe is dead, and the police are on their way. Bimo makes a swift exit. While unconscious, Bimo experiences a bizarre dream and wakes up next to Neptor. Neptor lets Bimo know that it was just then, and Ronnie was hanging out there all day, and that about a sock's worth of treasure has disappeared from the room. This revelation makes Bimo deduce that Ronnie must have swiped the sock to carry the loot, murdered Bebe to keep him silent, and attempted to frame Bimo for it. When Bimo heads upstairs to find Ronnie, Officer Davis tells Bimo they already know Ronnie killed Bebe and took the loot, letting Bimo off the hook. However, a lipstick written note left by Ronnie catches Bimo's eye and leads it outside to find Lorraine sitting on a treasure-filled barrel. Lorraine confesses to setting up Ronnie and Bebe and reveals that the sock is stashed in the secret grown-up kissing spot, making Bimo giggle. As the episode concludes, Finn and Jake return to the tree fort and everything goes back to color. Bimo shows Finn that his sock was in his pillow the whole time. The episode wraps up with Bimo revealing that their chicken is named Lorraine, who is red hot like pizza supper and blushes. This episode really amplifies Bimo's imaginative and determined character. Bimo takes the helm as the detective and despite multiple hurdles, doggedly follows the clues and eventually uncovers the truth. This episode is also a testament to the humor and quirkiness of Adventure Time, with Bimo's investigation involving a bunch of non-human characters and a simple case of a missing sock turning into an elaborate plot of deceit and a treasure heist. But do you think we're done here? Not even close. Bimo's wild imagination doesn't stop there. Next up, we're going to be diving into the episode Bimo Lost, where our beloved Bimo takes the center stage in an adventure that showcases its boundless imagination and almost human attributes. The episode kicks off with a giant eagle swooping in and snatching Bimo away to its nest, filled with chicks. Despite Bimo's best efforts, it ends up careening down a mountain, resulting in a broken screen. Suddenly, a bubble comes into the picture, deciding to join Bimo on an epic quest to find their way back home. As they wander around, Bimo and Bubble come across a hefty pink baby with a uniquely shaped hand. Bimo, always the caring one, covers the baby's hand with a leaf, compliments the baby, and deduces it must be lost too. With that, Bimo makes the executive decision to bring the baby along, dubbing it Ricky. Ignoring Bubble's suggestion to name it Sparkle, here we see Bimo's imagination at play, turning this adventure into a full-blown buddy story. Soon, they encounter a bridge with no handrails and a spooky howling sound in the distance. Choosing bravery over caution, they decide to cross it. Sadly, Ricky tumbles off the bridge, and Bimo leaps after him. As they get swept towards a waterfall, Bubble pulls off a heroic save by triggering a chain reaction that blocks their fall. After this wet and wild incident, Bimo's batteries get soaked, causing it to shut down. Following a well-deserved rest, they wake up the next day, when Ricky reinserts Bimo's batteries. However, their reunion is cut short when the source of the earlier howling sound, Ricky's mother, shows up to claim it. After a bit of shaming, she departs, leaving Bimo and Bubble to continue their journey. Finally, they make it back to the tree fort. As they wait for Finn and Jake to open the door, Bubble pops a question to Bimo. Overjoyed, Bimo accepts, but the celebration is cut short. When Jake playfully pops Bubble upon opening the door. Despite this, Bubble's voice reassures Bimo, explaining that it has become air, and they can now be together forever. Bimo, in classic Bimo fashion, is over the moon, waving its arms and cheering. This episode is a grand showcase of Bimo's imaginative prowess. Throughout the journey, Bimo treats Bubble and Ricky as fellow adventurers, projecting human-like qualities onto them. We see Bimo's resilience, determination, and capacity for love, whether it's caring for Bubble and Ricky, striving to get back home, or gleefully accepting Bubble's proposal. Bimo's personality shines through. These imaginative adventures and the display of very human emotions and behaviors remain a staple throughout the series. But hold on, 
BMO's flights of fancy are far from over. We've still got a fantastic episode dedicated to football to delve into. So get ready. We finally arrived at the fascinating episode of football, where the lines between reality and imagination blur for our little buddy BMO. In this episode, BMO and its mirror friend football decide to pull off a freaky Friday and switch places for a day. As football steps into the technicolor reality, she finds simple joys like playing with a duck she names Carlos and interacting with Finn and Jake. When probed about her life in the mirror world, she reveals it as cold, empty, lonely, shedding light on the stark solitude she endures. On the other hand, Bimo's transition to the mirror world leaves it feeling a bit incomplete, to say the least. The real world's vibrancy and life don't translate into the mirror. To make matters worse, football drops a bombshell that she intends to permanently reside in the real world, causing Bimo to panic. In the real world, football grapples with seeing Bimo's reflection everywhere she turns. This turmoil culminates in a frenzy that includes a kitchen demolition derby, mirror smashing, and some stern words from Finn and Jake. In her quest to escape reflections, football retreats to the only safe haven, the roof. But alas, a monstrous reflection of Bimo on the chimney terrifies her, leading to a tumble into the pond. This unexpected dunk switches Bimo and football back to their respective realities. Once back in its familiar world, Bimo showcases its empathy and capacity for forgiveness, overlooking the chaos football unleashed and promising to visit her in the mirror world. Football's loneliness and longing for the real world's vibrancy are brought into sharper focus in this episode. Episode. But don't you worry, our journey with BMO doesn't stop here. There are still several episodes that beautifully illustrates BMO's growth throughout the series. Are you ready to dive in? Oh, strap in folks, because we're hitting some of the most exciting twists in BMO's journey. And in my opinion, one of the best episodes of Adventure Time. Starting with the two-parter, the more you mow, the mo you know. The tale begins with a fellow creation of Mo, Amo, returning after a long journey. Amo actually came before BMO, but there's something awry with Amo's heart, causing a destructive desire for love. Arriving at the factory, Amo finds Mo, his creator, at the brink of death. In his dying breaths, Mo hands Amo his memory backup, hoping to rest in peace among the stars. Amo, however, has other plans. Witnessing the love and compassion among the society of Mo's at the factory, Amo's jealousy reaches boiling point. Harnessing Mo's memories, Amo manipulates the Mo's, leading them to a tragic end in a trash compactor. The crushed Mo's form a single entity, all Mo. Upon discovering Bimo's love-filled life with Finn and Jake, Amo concocts a sinister plot to take Bimo's place. In Bimo's birthday party, Amo, donning the disguise of Mo, weaves a tale of Bimo embarking on a solo journey to the factory to learn how to be grown up. Reluctant at first, Finn and Jake eventually allow Bimo to leave. Under the guise of Mo, Amo remains at the tree fort, acting as a Bimo substitute. On reaching the factory, Bimo stumbles upon a trap designed to destroy it. However, Bimo successfully evades it, rescuing all Mo, and they head back to the tree fort. A showdown between Bimo and Amo ends with Bimo pushing Amo off a cliff to his demise. Throughout this two-part series of The More You Mow, The Mow You Know, Bimo takes a deep dive into understanding what growing up truly means. With the sense of wonder and curiosity that's so characteristic of Bimo, it looks at the pros and cons of adulthood. Sure, being old enough to drive to the playground and buy pacifiers sounds like a total win, but will Finn and Jake still love it? And a question that sends shivers down Bimo's circuits, will it still love them? Bimo is plunged into a world of uncertainty, wondering, does growing up just change your body or also your soul. This introspective journey leads Bimo to realize that as much as it would like to, it can't stay the same forever. By grappling with these profound questions, Bimo begins to reveal signs of mental maturity. As it overcomes various challenges, Bimo finds wisdom in the midst of chaos. The climax of Bimo's journey unfolds in a battle with his older sibling Amo. Despite taking considerable damage, Bimo perseveres until Amo is defeated. This intense encounter brings Bimo face to face with the confusing reality of adulthood. Bimo candidly shares its feelings with Finn, Jake, and Neptor, admitting, I'm not grown up, or I'm, I'm too grown up now. I think I just killed someone. Bimo is left in a whirlwind of thoughts, attempting to reconcile the weight of its actions and emotions. However, by the end, Bimo realizes the power of self-belief and the strength of its imaginative spirit. Bimo learns that growing up doesn't mean losing the essence of who you are. Instead, it's about staying true to oneself amid the roller coaster of life. Understanding that growing up isn't about shedding one's childhood, but evolving while cherishing those cherished attributes. Bimo's journey of growth and self-discovery is a profound lesson for all of us, don't you think? 
who knew an animated, adorable video game console could teach us so much about life in adulthood? In later episodes, we see Bimo revisiting its cowboy persona from the days of being the sheriff of the drift. In a fun twist of events, Bimo, Finn, and Jake find themselves in a real shootout with Jake's old foe, Mima. They manage to apprehend her, but not before she escapes or is released from the Candy Kingdom. Bimo's adventures also bring an unlikely friendship with the Ice King. They make an interesting duo, to say the least. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for. Bimo's crucial role and the series finale come along with me. Are you as excited as I am to delve into this one? So what really went down and the series finale come along with me? Well, picture this. Bimo's chilling in the tree fort, totally missing the big showdown between Gumbald and Princess Bubblegum. But things take a wild turn when Golb, yeah, that scary big dude, makes his grand entrance, swallowing Finn, Betty Groff, and the Ice King whole. Now, Jake, in full hero mode, sprints to tackle one of Golb's monstrous minions and at least save Bimo in the tree fort. But alas, Jake fails, and our trusty Bimo, now sporting a battle-scarred faceplate, steps up. Bimo consoles a tear streak shrunken down Jake, saying, it's time to be the pop. Bimo then breaks into a touching rendition of Time Adventure, comforting Jake during what seems like their final moments. But plot twist, Golb's a creature of chaos, and Bimo's harmonious tune is like a punch to the gut for him and his minions. As everyone in Oo adds their voice to Bimo's song, they overpower Golb's minions, save Finn and Simon Petrikov, and give Betty enough time to seize control of Golb and send him packing. Now fast forward a bit, and we see Bimo, all fixed up, sending Moe's memory disc into space via a rocket. That's some touching tribute to Moe's wish, huh? And of course, with a little help from Banana Man and Alba. Now flash forward a few millennia, and who's the new King of Oo? Our boy Bimo, living it up at the top of Mount Kragdor, surrounded by relics from the past, thought to be nothing more than a legend. Shermie and Beth come looking for answers about Finn's prosthetic arm, which they found while scavenging. Although Bimo initially seems peeved at the duo rummaging through his stuff, seeing the arm softens him. Despite having forgotten Finn's name, now calling him Phil, Bimo still has a fond place in his circuits for him and Jake. He even tells the duo about the epic fight with Gold, pretty much the end of it, revealing the final fate of all his friends. Inspired by Bimo's story, Shermie and Beth set off to reclaim the Finn Sword from Burn's tree, kickstarting a brand new adventure time in the land of Oo. Woo! Bimo's journey had us all dancing, laughing, and making Maybe shedding a pixelated tear, huh? But hang on to your game controllers because we're not done yet. Ready for a sugar rush with a dash of mystery? As we shift from our tiny tech hero, we're headed straight into, hold on to your candy wrappers, unveiling Candy Kingdom's dark secrets and future in Adventure Time. Wow, just look at the growth of the Candy Kingdom. It's so amazing to see. Surely this was all due to hard work and dedication with no darker side, right? Right? Oh boy. Let's talk about it. Grab your favorite candy as we travel back over 800 years years ago to the root of the Candy Kingdom. Picture this, a nascent netty freshly formed from the mother gun, along with PB, latched onto a tree, an innocent act that would lay the foundation of the Candy Kingdom. This very tree, the heart of the kingdom, nourished netty, and his juice would later serve the candy citizens in a remarkable way, like bathing and healing. Can you imagine a world where your bathwater doubles as a health potion? Well, in the Candy Kingdom, imagination is reality. Now enter the architect of the Candy Kingdom, Bonnabelle Bubblegum, or as most of you probably know her, Princess Bubblegum. Princess Bubblegum was always by netty side. Even after he lashed onto the tree, she built her entire home around Nettie and this tree. But with this came loneliness. Picture her alone in a rustic cabin with only Nettie as her companion. But her mind was filled with visions of family dinners, hearty laughs, and companionship. So she created Uncle Gumbald, Aunt Lolly, and Cousin Chicle. This event was more than just an act of creation. It was the first stroke on a canvas destined to become a masterpiece. Or was it a battleground? It was a time of sweet dreams. Together they built a Candy Town, a Willy Wonka-esque landscape filled with buildings that could make your sweet tooth tingle, and planted taffy trees that swayed with the wind. But like a sour gumball and a bag of sweets, discord arose. Uncle Gumball had grand plans, a vision for a sprawling candy city, but Bonnabelle disagreed. In Uncle Gumball's eyes, he was the eldest. He should be the one to take the leader role. But in Bonnabelle's eyes, she was the lead. After all, she created Uncle Gumball. So tensions grew. To express her disagreement, Bonnabelle pulled out a trump card, a butterscotch bomb. Imagine a caramel explosion transforming the potential city site into Lake Butterscotch. How's that for a dramatic response? Uncle Gumbald, of course, didn't take this lightly. He plotted revenge, creating a boyfriend for Bonnabelle, Mr. Cream Puff, and distracted her with a date. As our unsuspecting princess was away, Gumbald, Lolly, and Chicle huddled in conspiracy. Imagine the tension. The whispers of treason filled the room as they plotted to overthrow Bonnabelle and realize their vision of a candy city. The key to this scheme was the mysterious dum-dum juice, a mind-altering concoction. One bite of this dum-dum juice cupcake, and bam, Lolly 
and Chicle turned into Candy for getting their previous selves. But our princess was no damsel in distress. She sensed the treachery and caught Gumball in the act. In a high octane showdown, she shot a pea shooter, splashing the dum dum juice onto Gumball, transforming him into a talking bowl of fruit punch. Bonnabelle noticed the transformed trio seemed happy. Inspired by their joy, she crowned herself princess, marking the dawn of the Candy Kingdom. But this is where things take a turn, folks. Would you still wish to live in a kingdom built on such a dark past? I guess for the Candy citizens, they don't really have much of a choice. As the kingdom took shape, Princess Bubblegum and the Candy people toiled hard, yet faced a sinister challenge. A river of radioactive sludge coursed through the heart of the kingdom, a neon green nemesis that held the horrifying power to mutate anyone who dared touch it. The kingdom's cheerful facade hid this menacing force, a secret kept buried under candy. In response to this threat, Princess Bubblegum introduced a revolutionary defense, the creation of the Gumball Guardians. Picture colossal candy defenders towering above the walls, their vigilant eyes armed with lasers, scanning the kingdom for danger. But the river's presence couldn't be entirely contained. Despite the kingdom's progression, it triggered a sequence of events that led to an outsider named Shoko getting embroiled in a mission to retrieve Princess Bubblegum's amulet. The Gumball Guardians and their protective fervor blasted Shoko, causing her to fall into the toxic river, marking a tragic incident in the kingdom's history. This era, marked by the radioactive river, was a significant chapter in the Candy Kingdom's history, a chapter that highlighted the fine line between protection and harm, the choices made for the kingdom's well-being, and the sacrifices endured for its prosperity. This raises one huge question. How far would Bubblegum go to protect her kingdom? With its shadowy past hidden beneath layers of candy, the kingdom began to look towards brighter days, and brighter they were. Following the era of the radioactive river and the sacrifices made, Princess Bubblegum's rule saw the candy kingdom turn a new leaf. The construction was finally complete, and the kingdom blossomed into a state of prosperity. Amidst candy-coated walls and jubilant citizens, it thrived, embracing peace and harmony that seemed so distant during its formative years. Yet, as in any kingdom, peace was occasionally disrupted by threats. One of the most dramatic incidents was the terrifying arrival of the Lich. But even in the face of such formidable evil, the candy kingdom stood tall. Thanks to the legendary hero, Billy, he defeated the Lich, confining it within an amber prison at the very heart of the candy castle. This victory was more than just a sigh of relief. It symbolized the kingdom's resilience, the tale of triumph echoing through the halls of the candy castle, becoming part of the kingdom's enduring lore. But remember, after a victory, there's often a call before another storm. But as is the case with every thriving kingdom, the mantle of protection needed to be passed on. As we weave our way through the vibrant tapestry of the Candy Kingdom's chronicles, a new era ushers in with the arrival of two unlikely heroes, Finn and Jake. Their induction into the kingdom brought a paradigm shift in its security dynamics. Finn and Jake, not just mere subjects of the kingdom, assumed the role of peacekeepers, the new custodians of law enforcement, an endeavor that outstripped the Banana Guard's capabilities. With their unwavering allegiance pledged to the Candy Kingdom, they stood as the reigning champions of her throne. But as the kingdom relished in harmony, a question lingered in the shadows. How long would this peace last? In an event that shook the very foundations of the kingdom, as shown in Hot Diggity Doom, the title of Princess was put to a democratic test. Despite her countless years of dedication, Princess Bubblegum lost her throne in the election, shocking the kingdom to its very core. The King of Ooh ascended to power, and our beloved Princess Bubblegum withdrew to Uncle Gumball's cabin by the serene Lake Butterscotch. The reign of the King of Ooh was far from smooth. In the Dark Cloud, his inefficiencies as a ruler sparked a rebellion among the Candy people, leading to his deposition. In a twist of events, Crunchy replaced him as Princess, before Bubblegum reclaimed her position and moved back into the castle. This reinstatement was soon followed by an unprecedented event in Sky Oaks 2. Lumpy Space Princess's anti-elemental lumps broke the spell that had kept everyone in their transformed state. Uncle Gumball, Aunt Lolly, Cousin Chicle, all are back. Princess Bubblegum's relatives were reverted to their original selves after eight centuries. However, old grudges lingered. Gumball, her uncle, resumed his plans of betrayal, creating the city-state of Gumballia and its cake soldier army. In a bid to avoid an impending war, Finn and Jake confronted Gumball. Despite seemingly making peace, the threat of Gumball's dum-dum juice revealed his betrayal. Following this, Princess Bubblegum formally declared war on Gumballia. As we venture into the chapters of Come Along With Me, the finale, the stage was set for a clash of titans, with each side rallying sizable armies and allies. However, in a world as unpredictable as Boo, resolution came not from a battlefield, but from a dream. The nightmare juice induced slumber brought Princess Bubblegum and Gumball together, where an apology and a spilled happy juice solution ultimately led to an agreement of peace. Yet, the celebration was short-lived as Golb descended upon the kingdoms. The kingdoms rallied together, setting aside past differences to defeat the intruder. Once the dust settled, the Candy Kingdom was safe once again. But this isn't over. A glimpse into the distant lands reveals a slightly changed kingdom in the near future. Absence of Gumball Guardians, the change 
Sky, and a newly crowned ruler, Peppermint Butler, signal a new era. However, Princess Bubblegum's crown still graces her head, suggesting her continued influence over the kingdom. As Distant Lands revealed, the kingdom was on the brink of change, changes that raised questions about its future. As we look even further into the future, we're left with a somber vision. Fast forwarding to the events of Lemon Hope Part 2, 1000 years in the future, the Candy Kingdom lies in ruins, abandoned and deserted. In Grable's 1000 Plus, the former citizens are preserved in a mobile version of their kingdom, the Prize Ball Guardian. Despite the kingdom's uncertain future, Princess Bubblegum takes precautionary steps in High Strangers, sending colonization missiles to other planets. Yet, the reason for the kingdom's abandonment remains an unsolved mystery. After the somewhat dark but truly amazing history of the Candy Kingdom, and after the episode Lemon Hope Part 2 and the Distant Lands miniseries, I can't help but ask myself, what the heck happened to the Candy Kingdom? Before we unravel that mystery, let's delve into a curious chapter in the kingdom's history. Why did Princess Bubblegum, the creator and long-standing ruler of the Candy Kingdom, pass on her mantle to Peppa, a loyal yet unconventional subject? And will she ever return to rule the Candy Kingdom? Well, Peppermint Butler is deeply devoted to the Candy Kingdom. Over time, we have seen him shoulder responsibilities and navigate crises alongside Princess Bubblegum, his competence and dedication shining through. It's in these unassuming moments that we begin to see why Princess Bubblegum chose him as her successor. Perhaps there's even more to Pet Butt's story than meets the eye. Could it be that Princess Bubblegum intentionally crafted Pet Butt to stand out from the rest of the candy citizens? I mean, he does seem a lot more aware compared to the other candy citizens. Is his heightened awareness a testament to PB's foresight? A sign that he was destined to eventually don her crown? It's a possibility that we just can't really ignore. Princess Bubblegum, though no longer the acting ruler, is never truly away from her kingdom. But even as, presumably, Pet Butt takes over charge at the Candy Kingdom, she continues to wear the crown. This isn't merely a vestige of her rule. It's a symbol of her enduring bond with the Candy Kingdom, a testament that she remains their creator, their guardian, their eternal guiding star. So, would Princess Bubblegum ever return? Well, the answer actually lies in her past, although not right away. But remember how she challenged the King Abu to reclaim her spot, driven by her longing for her citizens? There lies your answer. Princess Bubblegum's devotion to her kingdom knows no bounds. While the crown may rest on Pet Butt's head, the true spirit of the Candy Kingdom lies with her. If danger ever shadows her kingdom, rest assured, Princess Bubblegum will be ready to step to the fret, ready to lead her people into the light once again. This undying dedication makes us wonder about the future she has envisioned, the challenges she may have foreseen. This brings us to a sight that's why unsettled? Picture this, the Candy Kingdom, once a canvas of color, life, and innovation, now stands silent in a thousand years time. An abandoned relic, a ghost of its past glory, presents an enigma that sends chills down our spines. There's an unsolved mystery that lurks here, one that we will be unraveling soon. What could have possibly led to such drastic changes? But before we try to decipher this drastic change, let's take a moment to appreciate the journey that led the Candy Kingdom to its peak. How did Princess Bubblegum, with her unwavering determination, transform this land of sweets and slimes into a beacon of progress and advance. I mean, just look at it. Although it's in ruins now, it's honestly crazy. Was it the inevitable march of destiny or the tangible result of one princess's relentless efforts? The advancement of the Candy Kingdom can largely be attributed to Princess Bubblegum's exceptional scientific prowess and forward-thinking mindset. As the architect of the Candy Kingdom, she constantly innovated, pushing boundaries and harnessing technology to make her kingdom flourish. From creations like the Gumball Guardians and her lab's countless inventions, we see a pattern of progress driven by her relentless pursuit of knowledge and dedication to her people's well-being, as she once said. Because responsibility demands sacrifice. And it's clear she lived by these words, often putting the kingdom before her own needs. But even as we marvel at the kingdom's past glory, an unnerving question begins to push its way into our minds. What could have possibly led to its apparent desolation? Could the vibrant candy kingdom we've come to know and love truly be left abandoned? Or is there something more beneath the surface than me see I. Lemon Hope Part 2 and Grable's 1000 Plus hint at a future that is drastically different from the present, but it isn't necessarily one of doom and gloom. Perhaps it's not abandonment we're seeing, but change and evolution. But what brought about this change? Cast your minds back to High Strangers. Remember Princess Bubblegum's ambitious space colonization program? This was no whimsical side project. No, it was a testament to her foresight, her willingness to explore the unknown for her kingdom's survival. Intriguingly, this desolate future Candy Kingdom might just be a chrysalis, a cocoon left behind as its inhabitants spread their wings towards the stars. Could the abandoned structures we see merely be the stepping stones of a civilization that's taken to the skies? Consider the Prize Ball Guardian, a colossal life-preserving entity roaming the land of Ooh. Could this be a symbol of the Candy Kingdom's evolution, a safeguard for its citizens voyaging through the cosmos? Why the leap to stars?
Barza. Could the near apocalyptic confrontation with Gold have spurred this decision? Faced with such a massive threat, wouldn't it make sense for PB to seek a safer future for her citizens among the stars? But let's not forget, Princess Bubblegum is a pioneer at heart, a relentless seeker of new frontiers. Might the cosmos have presented her an opportunity for growth? A challenge for her innovative spirit? A canvas vast and untamed? Ready to be colored with the spirit of the Candy Kingdom? And so, we come to a fascinating possibility. The Candy Kingdom may not have met its end in desolation, but instead embracing a thrilling new chapter among the stars. Far from a tale of decline, it's a saga of resilience and vision, a testament to the enduring spirit of a kingdom that continues to shine through thick and thin, wherever it may be. We're going to fly Princess Bubblegum's probes back to our abandoned home planet. They'll have all the space they need to start their new Candy Kingdom. Now, the Candy Kingdom's dark past and mysterious future is definitely one of the strangest lore aspects of the show. But what if I told you that there might be something even more strange? Jake, you heard that right. Our lovable stretchy canine. But what's so strange and mysterious about Jake? Well, you know how he's stretchy, right? How did he get those powers in the first place? Well, in this video, I reveal everything. And what we uncover is truly astonishing. Like, it actually blew my mind. So, click on this video right now to unravel Jake's mysterious past from Adventure Time. And you know, while you're at it, maybe hit the subscribe button if you enjoyed this video, or if you just enjoy Adventure Time in general. But as always, my friends, stay adventurous.